Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition, our first of 2021 of COVID State of Play. Uh, I'm Jonathan Citrin. I uh, teach on technology and governance topics, and uh, we do this uh, podcast Zoomcast together with um, my intrepid colleague, Margaret Bordeaux, physician and public health expert who's been following the situation with the pandemic from its inception. And together we try to figure out um, what's going on, what's gonna happen next and what we should do about uh, all of it. And our thinking for uh, today's uh, installment is to spend roughly half the time, half an hour uh, on just canvassing where we're at and where we're going together, uh, the two of us. And then we'll be joined by Renee DeResta who has done substantial research on the dynamics, sources, and interventions around disinformation. Uh, and is gonna talk about that, particularly with respect to vaccine dis and misinformation and uh, how that's going and what might be done about problems there. Um, so let's start just, uh, Margaret, we have our conceit of just saying and it's kind of, word or phrase. We're all tired. It's been a marathon. Uh, tell us where we're at. This. What's the state of play for COVID 2021 January? Oh, well, you know, I always look forward to that question and, and dread it at the same time. Um, I, I, I look forward to it because, you know, it's a, it's a chance to acknowledge that time is moving forward and things are changing. Um, and it's also a dread because, you know, obviously we're all exhausted and um, this has really been a much more significant, drawn out, harmful, destructive, horrible event than I think uh, when you and I first met, I think either of us probably anticipated mm -hmm. in some sense. Um, um just real quick, it feels yeah. like uh, on the side of maybe we've turned the corner, we now actually have three at least approved and functioning vaccines uh, around the world, or maybe borderline third approval here in the US. Um, so now it's just sort of the block and tackle mechanics, but you know, light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing. Uh, and then in the other column is the fact, maybe not incompatible with it, that yesterday the country recorded the highest number of COVID deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. And I guess we're on track to be doing 20,000 deaths a week, um, which there were early comparisons to flu uh, in the beginning stages of the pandemic. Uh, I understand we have roughly 20,000 deaths by flu every year. So we're doing a year's worth of flu deaths every week at this point. So, yeah. So, <laughs> well, you you summarize it well. So the the phrase that I was going to was going to say uh, that I think is, is summarizes the state of play is race against the clock. Um, you know, can we reach herd immunity through a vaccination? Uh, before hundreds of thousands or even 1 million Americans die of COVID. Uh, and that's the, the state of play in the United States. And, and can know. I just ask on that front then, one dimension of the race is just to try to get it under control before an unconscionable number, of course, we're already past that, an unconscionable number of people die. Another way maybe of conceiving of it, especially with all the word of different strains floating around, some of which are substantially more transmissible, though not, it seems, innately more deadly, but of course more transmissible means more deaths. Um, is that also a form of a race against the clock? Uh, no question. Given those new strains? No question. Yeah. So, you know, how I'm sort of thinking about it is on one corner you have team US humans and in the other other lane you have uh, team COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have some good things going for us over on team US human. Uh, number one, as you mentioned, we have vaccines. I mean, sort of a remarkable feat. Uh, we have vaccines uh, that have been so rapidly produced. Uh, really, I think uh, we were celebrating the anniversary uh, a couple weeks ago of um, the uh, 
the publication of the genome of COVID uh, one year ago. And now we have two vaccines uh, that are um, available in this uh, country. Now I'm saying vaccines very carefully because as we've said over and over again, vaccines have never saved a single life. Only vaccination, only vaccination. It's the shun that matters. It's the implementation. So vaccinated right. people rather than something in a box. Exactly. You have to get the vaccine in the arm uh, in order for it to be uh, life saving. And just given the very first invocation of vaccination here, um, really good question already uh, before us, which I'll convey, which is do we know yet how much? Uh, the vaccine prevents uh, the untoward symptoms up to and including death in somebody who's received it with really good effectiveness, say up to 95%, versus uh, it prevents people from themselves continuing to transmit it even if they've been successfully vaccinated. I know there's theory on that. When would we know that? I guess by revealed numbers once vaccinations happen or? Yes, um, so that's right. So, so technically speaking, uh, the only data that we have uh, is uh, in regards to how well does the vaccine um, prevent uh, symptomatic disease. Okay, and, and that was how they did the, the, the phase three trials, whereas they only tested people when they had a symptom of, uh, of COVID. Uh, they only tested them to see if they were infected with COVID when they had a symptom of COVID. So they weren't routinely testing people who had the vaccine um, just you know, every three days to see whether they might have had an asymptomatic case. Okay, so so there we don't we don't know that answer. And the um, there is suggestive evidence that indeed it is, um, we do know that when people get the vaccine, they do have what we call neutralizing antibodies uh, against uh, COVID, so that's good. Um, and we know that, um, and we think that that is going to mean that if you have neutralizing antibody, that you are probably less likely to have symptomatic disease. But we don't have that key piece of data yet to absolutely prove that it, uh, that you, you know, essentially can be a carrier of COVID yes. even if you get the vaccine. So, um, so that data uh, is being collected, you know, by uh, the vaccine uh, manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies. Um, but it will take longer to come out and we just don't have the luxury of time to, you know, sit back and wait for that. Yeah. Um, so basically what we're saying is get the vaccine, but still, um, you know, in an abundance of cautions, you know, still uh, wear a mask and, and practice social distancing. Um, I don't think that's, I'm hopeful that we'll get some of that data uh, really soon. Um, you know, well, within a month uh, that we can that we can be able to see, but um, that that's that's where that debate is is you know how 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 much does the the vaccine protect? And there's some I mean there's some cool immunology behind that you know, and there's some cool sort of you know cool science discussions around it. Um, but I'm optimistic. Let me just say this: my my I think it's a I think it's not a safe bet, but it's a good bet that we are going to see some. Um, public health benefit in terms of um, in terms of decreasing transmission from those who have gotten vaccinated. So back to the race against the clock. What does Team Human have going for it, <laughs> and what does Team Virus have going for it? Okay, so Team Human has vaccines, which is awesome. Um, and the other thing we have going for us is we do have a non-vaccine public health strategy. Um, that is pretty good. Now, again, we have the strategy. We don't necessarily have the implementation of that strategy uh, in our corner. But the non-vaccine public health strategy that we um, have sort of landed on is what I like to call, again, the three-legged stool. Okay, so each leg of the stool is a different, different component of the overall strategy. And all of these components combined you know, make up the three-legged stool. You have to have kind of all three in order for the stool to stand up. Um, I, and so I'm just to review, I know we've, we've talked about this before, but one leg of the stool is environmental modifications. 
Um, and I should just say that these three legs of the stool are, are for the backbone of any strategy, any public health strategy in addressing any outbreak of an infectious disease. So one leg is you have your environmental modification strategy. We know that, um, that COVID is spread in droplets and droplets uh, travel far further in indoor spaces. We know some of the um, things that we can do to uh, separate people out uh, and create barriers in indoor spaces. We know some of the things we can do to make the ventilation and the air filtration uh, and the humidity of uh, indoor spaces um, uh, safer so the virus doesn't transmit as readily. So those are some of the environmental modifications we know. Uh, we, in the second leg of the stool is population-based measures. These are the things that you ask everyone in a population to do. Uh, we know that masks in this case are pretty effective. I mean, far more effective than I thought they would be at the beginning of the epidemic. So, you know, masks are fantastic. Social distancing does work. Um, so that's great. Uh, and then the third leg of the stool is contact tracing. And contact tracing, as we've talked about before, is sort of a four-part process. But the idea of contact tracing is that you're identifying individual chains of transmission um, and interrupting them. So you're figuring out who's infected and keeping them away from others so they can't transmit the infection. In order to keep people from transmitting and, and being in contact with others, you know, they require support. They require support to be in either quarantine if they've been exposed or in isolation if they're actually infected but are not in a hospital. So we have those three components uh, and, 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 you know, they work when we, when, when we use them. Um, the thing I've not talked about as much in that uh, public health strategy, but I think it's really important to say is, you know, the three legs of the stool are really important, but also the top of the stool is really important. Um, and the thing that holds all of them together. And I've started to call the top of the stool um, a public health intelligence capability. That's that all that means is that you have the ability to understand where the infection is spreading um, the context in which it's spreading and, and the ability to see if your mitigation efforts are working. Um, and that, that's probably been the part of the strategy we've struggled with the most. We've really had a hard time, you know, as you and I have discussed, uh, getting testing done, diagnostics done, so we understand who's infected. We've had a really hard time putting together the data uh, to do sort of cluster investigations where the disease is spreading. Um, but, you know, we're really building that out. So that's, um, that's team human. We have, we have vaccines and we have a public health strategy that we uh, feel comfortable works and we can refine as we, um, as we go forward. So that's team human. Team COVID, <laughs> this is what team COVID has. Team COVID um, uh, has a couple things going for it uh, that are significant. One, it is a disease that can spread asymptomatically. And that is really a bummer for team human because other diseases and outbreaks like Ebola. Ebola, you're just not gonna get it from an asymptomatic person. Not only that, you're not gonna get it from a person who's early in the course of their illness. So it's really at the end of the course of their illness that they are infectious. The same thing was true of SARS-1, the SARS virus epidemic that came out of China, went to you know Toronto, had a huge problem in Ontario it was really infectious at the end of the disease course. So it was really a matter of infection control in hospitals. That's how we ended SARS-1. COVID has this great ability to spread asymptomatically. And that's, that's a nice capability if you're COVID. The other thing- And just on that front, just to be clear, uh, and most of the asymptomatic spread turns out to be pre-symptomatic, that it is somebody that ends up feeling lousy later rather than the small number of people that never feel lousy at all, even though they went through a period in which they were contagious. That is a fantastic, yeah, fantastic reminder. Um, the majority of people who get COVID are, uh, do have symptoms at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's, uh, that's helpful. It is, it is true, it could have been where you just had a lot of, you know, complete asymptomatic, spread in, a, in totally asymptomatic people for the, the entire course of their illness. That and, does happen, but it's, it's unusual. 
And just while we're at it, uh, because it bears so much on a huge and ongoing debate, which you can tell me if it feels any more settled now than it has been before about schools and opening up the schools, if there are people more consistently who are asymptomatic the whole time, but possibly still transmitting, it'd be kids. Mm. And I'm just curious, do we have any better insight now into how much schools might be a hotbed of transmission among a bunch of kids, they go back home, spread it to their parents, et cetera, or is the fact that they tend not to show symptoms or severe illness mean that they're less transmitting? Yeah. So um, I don't, so that actually relates back to what I was thinking about public health intelligence. And, you know, mm. I'll tell you a story. Um, so, so my, my quick answer is that unfortunately we have not put ourselves in a position to have the public health intelligence uh, capability to study where um, clusters are occurring. Um, and I'll, uh, so let me tell you a, a story. So, so the, the fact is we still don't know, and I'm extremely frustrated by the fact that we just don't have good data to be able to say one way or the other, this, yes, schools are hot spots or schools are not hot spots. Um, and it's something that I'm, you know, extremely interested in leaning in on. But okay, so I'll tell you the story. So um, in this is, I'm going to change a lot of the details of the story because, um, you know, it, it's, it's drawn from a real experience. But um, so uh, let's say we recognize that um, there is a restaurant, we'll call it Restaurant X, and uh, we notice that two people uh, in the contact tracing program uh, that are being tracked ate at Restaurant X and on the same night, and they're both positive um, for COVID. We don't exactly know when they got their test, but we just know that they were there. So, okay, we go and investigate a restaurant X on those nights. Uh, and we, we look at everybody that came into that, into restaurant X and we find out lo and behold, two thirds of the people that dined in restaurant X on Thursday night um, are COVID positive. Well, we present this data to the restaurant owner and the restaurant owner says, it's not my restaurant nothing bad, they didn't get it in my restaurant, okay? What happened was COVID is really, uh, the, the rates in the community are very high. And it just so happened that, you know, the 60, the, out of the 100 people that ate in my restaurant that night, uh, you know, 60% of them just walked in infected. Okay, uh, that's one theory. Um, another hypothesis is when we said, oh gosh, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of people in your restaurant might've gotten COVID. Um, the, the waiters that worked in the restaurant on that night went out and got tested and sure enough, one of them was positive. So another person looks at it and says, uh, that waiter is the one that was, you know, asymptomatically spread it to all those tables that uh, he worked at that night. Um, and that's hypothesis number two. Hypothesis number three is, hmm, you know what? Uh, the people that are sitting in the repository in this restaurant they're actually 60 feet apart. Um, but uh, the restaurant owner, in order to kind of feel like she was addressing uh, ventilation, set up a lot of fans around the, around the restaurant that blew air from one side of the restaurant over to the other. Um, and I think that this is a problem essentially of ventilation where the index case gave, uh, that walked into the restaurant, a patron of the restaurant, gave uh, everyone else COVID because of these fans. So answering that is really important, right? I mean, answering whether um, it's the problem with the fans so that we can then make all of our indoor spaces a little bit more safe or is the answer testing all of your waiters before they go on shift uh, with a rapid antigen test? Um, or is the answer, you know, closing down all the restaurants because, um, you know, that's where spread is, spread is occurring or, you know, giving them money to uh, not go out of business until we're, you know, vaccinated. Um, you know, right now it's everyone's guess, everyone's hypothesis in that situation is, you know, valid hypothesis, but we have to put ourselves in the position to investigate which of those hypotheses is correct. And we can do that, um, and that we, we can, but we haven't put ourselves in a position to build out that capability. The way that you tease that out is um, 
that you need to do some genomic testing, some special testing of the, of the, the type, the strain that um, each of the people who were infected in the restaurant has. And then you can start to see how those uh, viral strains are related to one another. So all of that is a leaf on the tree Mm -hmm. of a public health intelligence capability. And this seems like a tree that has not been watered and fertilized well, even since last March. And I guess it's just a question of, all right, let's come up with possibly federal money to fund it and people willing to do it and kind of get going on it. Yeah, I, I you know, I think that we um, didn't clearly see the need for it until now. And we didn't clearly see the need for it uh, because uh, we didn't really think about the disease spreading in clusters uh, in the way that we now know that it does. Which gets back um, to KJ Sung's visit with us to talk about retrospective contact tracing. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. So and I just wanted to note too then, it shows the value of the public health intelligence, both to just add to humanity's knowledge about this particular affliction and how it spreads, in which case if you know, some other country is good at it. We could learn their lessons from their daycare centers and restaurants. Yeah. And then more specifically, just to identify clusters and figure out then uh, where you might need to intervene uh, with a shutdown or a uh, isolation or quarantine, sorry, quarantine. Exactly. So, so, so having that information, that's the top of that stool helps you strengthen each of the three legs of your public health response. It helps you do contact tracing better because you know who to test. Um, it helps you know how to uh, modify the environment more specifically. Um, and it also helps you know how to, you know, what, what to ask people to do. I mean, if you're going to say, look, there's no way we can make this restaurant safe. Sorry. Yes. There's no way. Uh, you know, then you say, okay, please don't go to restaurants and you try to compensate the business yes. owners so they can survive. So, which also looking yeah. back at Joe Allen's visit with us on ventilation and in other environmental modifications, it just remains striking to me that there've been there hasn't been, well, there's been a bunch of, at least from like my Instagram ad feed, uh, a bunch of people being creative about marketing different kinds of masks. There hasn't been a ton of creativity around marketing environmental modifications, much less subsidizing them. The way that you would subsidize, uh, ironically, tightening up a home and sealing it more for conservation purposes, which in Massachusetts say here, you get money from the state to do that. It's weird that the state wasn't saying, okay, here's an easy path by which to get and uh, help defray the costs of outdoor tents with heaters in them, if it turns out that that form of environmental yeah. modification actually helps. Well, one of the things that really frustrates me is, um, you know, a lot of people are like, well, is your leader, you know, following the science? I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, but. We're also we're just not doing the science. <laughs> I mean, to yeah. follow, you know, part of part of following the science means doing the science. Um, you know, you know, so so that that's right. I think the other thing that I worry about a lot is that Americans will, you know, Americans, we have a really tough relationship with public health and what we think public health is. Basically, we think public health is a vaccine. And that's great. Vaccines are wonderful, and I'm really excited about the COVID vaccines. Um, but it's it's not just it's not just a vaccine. In fact, most of the epidemics uh, of, that humans have experienced are controlled with not not with vaccines, uh, with other public health measures. Like I said, each of these legs of the three legged stool. Um, and so, when Americans do pay attention to public health, the other thing that we tend to think it is is asking people to. Uh, is just the, the population-based asks, that one leg of the stool. Like, you know, wear a mask, uh, you know, uh, wear a condom, <laughs> um, don't, you know, don't travel. And, you know, it's all about the individual's choice. It's like it's a DIY kind of enterprise. Um, and that gets, we always like to criticize one another. Oh, you didn't do it right. You know, you, this brought, it brought, you brought this on yourself. Uh, now you're sick because you didn't follow this advice and now you get, you're getting what you deserve. 
Um, and I think that that's a core sort of pathology around how America, well, pathology, I mean, it's one way to think about health um, and healthcare and who should have access to healthcare. Um, I don't think it's doing us any favors. I think that idea of health, healthcare, and public health as being a sort of individual responsibility instead of a collective security, collective enterprise is something that we just ha we have to, we have to move toward, I think, if we're going to be able to protect ourselves from this type of threat, um, from COVID in the short term and these types of threats, you know, in the long term, which brings up the thing I really want to talk to you about. <laughs> um, I'm anxious to. So, um, you know, the, the, the big thing that COVID has going for it uh, in the United States is really uh, Ameri how Americans have, have uh, the leadership uh, and the, the ways that we have, as a society have sort of tackled the outbreak has, has been, uh, to my eye, quite unfortunate. Um, and I, I do wanna sort of shift gears here and say, um, I was reflecting on this in particular uh, last week because I actually did have a you know, very harrowing uh, experience. Um, I was in the Capitol uh, last week um, with, uh, with my sister, who is a uh, new Congress member uh, who won her election uh, for Congress. She's a representative from uh, Georgia's seventh congressional district. And I went to Washington DC to watch her get sworn in to Congress on Sunday. Um, but I ended up sticking around. I think everybody was expecting there would be some kind of trouble uh, in the Capitol uh, last Wednesday. Um, and I ended up kind of sticking around. I didn't sort of I have to say I wasn't quite as prepared as I wish I'd been um, for what uh, what unfolded on Wednesday, um, which was I, I did join uh, my sister in her congressional office. The, the office building is is uh, attached to the Capitol through you know a series of hallways and tunnels, um, and you know was there when um, you know when uh, the 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 Capitol was attacked, um, and you know I was fortunately safe, we were all, you know, safe. Um, in general, I would say I, I worried truly for my life for about 30 minutes when um, the Capitol building was breached and there were thousands of extremely angry um, and violent attackers uh, coursing through the hallways. Um, but, you know, in the moment, uh, then, then we were in sort of lockdown for about six to eight hours, uh, kind of in the dark there with, um, phones on silent, uh, just watching the, uh, the TV um, and hoping that uh, nobody came for us. But it gave me a good long uh, set of hours there uh, to think about um, you know, where we are as a country, uh, both with respect to our political uh, leadership, um, but also you know, I think it does bear on the, the pandemic and how we've responded. And I think the particular um, moment uh, that I would draw from was when I thought, gosh, I'm going to be, and my sister are going to be dragged out in the hallway and executed um, right here. And I was thinking, how do I negotiate or talk to people who, you know, seem to really, their starting point here is that I am a satanic worshiping pedophile. Um, you know, that's, that's the starting point of, you know, where some people are being grounded. They believe the election was completely stolen. They're believing, you know, all sorts of things that they're hearing, um, you know, from their elected leaders and also from wherever they're getting information from. Um, and, it, and it really struck me that, you know, the big challenge here is like, gosh, how, how do we come up with, you know, a shared understanding of the world? Now we can, you know, I don't like the term shared reality because reality is reality, but <laughs> um, you know, a shared understanding of the world so that, we can, so that we can work on problems together. I mean, it's very hard to address an epidemic when your leadership has essentially been saying there is no epidemic. This is a, this is a, you know, a, a, a hoax. And the other thing I sort of was musing on as these hours ticked by um, was that I sort of wondered if, people, the, the public health measure of basically keeping people indoors has sort of shifted, maybe exaggerated their interactions online. You know, and maybe it's it, in the, of itself is that they're coming into contact with more sort of content from the internet. They're living more of their life uh, on the internet. They're finding more community on the internet because 
of this sort of public health approach of, you know, people not going into work or people, um, you know, uh, really radically changing the way that they're interacting with their, um, you know, bricks and mortar society. Um, and I thought, gosh, well, maybe this is really a radicalization process that has actually been caused by a public health response uh, to an epidemic. And I thought, you know, the person I really want to talk to about that, if I make it out of here alive, is um, Jonathan Zittrain. Oh. <laughs> wow. So I'm looking forward to our meeting today. Yes. <laughs> That's um, quite a wind up for a question. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, of course, first, um, just uh you know i'm in awe of your poise and grace and ability to kind of take up the mantle again including inhabiting your professional role in trying to make progress on this amidst a literally traumatizing extreme you would think zero times in a lifetime experience that you just described and your point that that is an experience that is now something that is not uncommon, which is extraordinary. That not only are we talking about thousands of people within the capital on the receiving end of that, but across the country in their respective roles. I mean, it isn't just January 6th, you have leading public health officials resigning because quite reasonably, they feel like it's not worth it to risk their families and their own lives, trying to do a job that, you know, requires trade-offs and hard choices and is both following the science and then applying a set of values and trade-offs on top of that. Um, and I think also within your question is the really astute observation of, this kind of gets back to um, team COVID appears allied with team uh, disintegration of the cohesiveness of an imagined community mm -hmm. where you've got, just as you were saying, a bunch of isolation among people. You've got, uh, as has been pointed out before, the really the direct inaptness of the phrase social distancing. It's physical distancing. It's not social distancing. It's physical distancing that you, it's a physical process you're trying to interrupt. Mm. But those, of course, are intertwined. And if you pass people on the street, the idea that you should cross to the other side and <laughs> along with that comes, don't even really look at them. What if photons carry it too? I don't want it entering my eyes. You know, that's surely, to what degree, I guess, remains to be measured, but surely a piece of how in the absence of affirmative ways of reversing the entropy, you get a decay of the basic bonds of cohesiveness that when you need a public health response that says we're all in it together, you might be asymptomatic, but you could be throwing it to others. And the initial story, I understand maybe since changed, uh, maybe this is actually the second story, not the initial one, but now we're into the third, of masks primarily prevent you from transmitting you know, regular cloth masks more than they do preventing you from getting it. But that means you, to wear it is a noble thing. And that's against a backdrop. When you mentioned leadership before, you pointed out a, you know, kind of a denial of the degree of severity. It was the president who said, look how many flu deaths we had last year. Look how many COVID deaths we had this week. What's the big deal? Multiple times. But also just, I think back to the Challenger explosion and the speech that President Reagan delivered, written by Peggy Newman, mm -hmm. uh, quoting the, the poem of having slipped the surly bonds of earth, it was a collective horror, a tragedy, one that I was a kid and it's, it was seared upon me as you know one of the signal memorable events of my childhood. But part of the memory of that event was the rallying of the national leadership mm -hmm. to tell a story about resilience and say, we can make this happen. And it's just interesting from a president who has invoked uh, a, a connection to Winston Churchill to see an absence of the kind of, you know, as, as historians have described it in Britain, 
it's just like there were times when the island appeared pulled together only by just this one cigar chomping guy's iron will to say it's just we're gonna pull through it and um that may be an example of some larger variables for which some of the technical dimension, which is really what you're asking me about, and as you can probably already guess given the time of the hour, but also because of the person I would want to most ask about it right now, we're going to call in Renee DiResta in just a moment, to then against that backdrop say, what is the architecture of the way in which we're communicating, particularly communicating during uh, a physical um, isolation, that might be exacerbating the shared reality. And I would also add to that, it's not just sort of a dispassionate pursuit of or confrontation with facts and different people are getting facts in different places so they reasonably come to different conclusions. I, I have to say, I, I think there is an element of just direct hatred for its own sake that is latent within many, if not all of us, and that can be with the right tools, fanned and expanded. And once it reaches a certain critical mass, it can become itself something that's hard to race against. It can become consuming. And uh, just linking back to your premise around the activities at the Capitol, the insurrection at the Capitol last week, I think, Maybe it remains just a direct intelligence question around is what we were looking at more described by, thanks to networking in part, uh, you've just got Charlottesville Plus, a group of people who by their own description would realize and say they are extremists and you just managed to gather all of them in one place to wreak havoc. Or are we talking about a mass radicalization due to the factors we're talking about for which uh, it's just the, the Charlottesville model is not helpful because you're talking about lots and lots of people and therefore an, an ability to take the wearing of a mask and turn it into a values issue where to wear it is to deny your patriotism uh, according to those who are against it um, that there could be many, many people that end up somehow feeling that way. So uh, unless you've got reactions to that right now, I wonder if this isn't the right time to bring in Renee. Uh, welcome, Renee DiResta. Uh, hello, hello. And uh, either any reactions to any of the conversation that Margaret and I have had so far and a bunch of stuff I just hastily put on the table, uh, and or it would be great to hear just what you're seeing out there, what the usual suspect platforms are up to and how much you think it matters what they're up to, how much the not usual suspect platforms matter, especially as you see now mass deplatforming of some of the sources and echoes of disinformation and all right, where is that going to go and reform? Um, and your sense, uh, Renee, if possible, of the trajectory of all of this. Is this something that, you know, the story about the vaccine is we have, we know what we need to do, now we just have to turn to doing it. Or is this problem one that's much less farther along where it's not even as clear what to do and what would be effective and who should be doing it? I don't know, I'm curious, Renee, what you're seeing and, uh, and finally, just to uh, echo one of the questions in our queue, to what extent do you think the major platforms are viewing this as a very specific case of disinformation around say vaccinations, and they're gonna have a strategy around that mm -hmm. versus what Margaret was linking it to, which is a broader problem of a failure of, of recognizing a shared reality for which lots of other forms of radicalization and disinformation are in play. Yeah, well, there's a lot there. So um, I would say the, just to answer the last question first, uh, in my conversations with the platforms, they are absolutely aware that this ties into the bespoke realities problem um, and that there is a lot more happening here than just vaccine hesitancy. 
Um, so to, to let me let me try to draw some some through lines, both with um, the work that I do at Stanford Internet Observatory and our various projects. We had um, we're just coming off of one called the Election Integrity Partnership, which looked specifically at mis and disinformation related to voting. So very narrowly scoped around voting, but narrowly scoped around voting really turned into looking at pervasive delegitimization of an election over a period of months. And the repetition to certain uh, communities, not only from social media peer-to-peer -peer communications, but also the incorporation of uh, social as yet one more channel in the overall information ecosystem. So broadcast and social, for some reason we talk about them separately. I would argue that, uh, that that's really a very kind of uh, outdated way of viewing the social channel. And that's because part of the, one of the active participants in the uh, bespoke reality creation around the election, this delegitimization preemptively laying the groundwork to claim that the election was stolen uh, two to three months before election day, really involved not only the social sphere, but the way in which the social sphere pulls in information from the alt media ecosystem. So in the large form, that's Newsmax and OAN. Uh, in the kind of mid-size format, that's things like influencers, the dynamic of uh, ordinary people who have amassed very large audiences because they speak to a very particularly targeted uh, segment of a, of a political affinity group. And those folks um, amass massive audiences and then in turn serve as a kind of micro or demi media uh, that then provide this conduit by which information is moving sometimes from the bottom up from you know, chatter in the conspiratorial communities that makes its way up to the president retweeting it and Newsmax covering it. Sometimes it goes the other direction, uh, that kind of emergent media class putting out a conspiracy or delegitimization claim that then in turn makes its way down into the echo chambers that, that treat that media as a, as a trusted source. So a lot of the information dynamics here, while we saw them applied in the context of the election over, over many months, are also the exact same dynamics that are in play in the conversation around uh, vaccination and public health and coronavirus, uh, you know, COVID response more broadly. And that's because the, again, that phenomenon of of information making its way both kind of bottom up and top down, the substance, the content is, um, is I think less important to understand as a pivotal driving force in this uh, versus the dynamics, the ways in which that happens, um, the ways in which that happens absent what we would call historically um, either journalistic ethics or gatekeeping or uh, the idea of, of, of us all operating in one reality because we're all seeing the same broad uh, swath of media properties. Now you, we have a series of environments in which, depending on which one you're in, your view of the world is distinctly different than uh, someone else's view of the world who is not a participant in that particular chamber. And so, the in it, so we have the election integrity work that we've been doing, but those same pathways are very much in play for conversations related to coronavirus response and the COVID vaccine. And that's because a lot of the dynamics are, are also really reliant on the question of who people trust. Uh, mm -hmm. Who do they trust for their information? Uh, who do they think is telling them the truth? Uh, how, you know, how, do, how do they process um, you know, what, uh, w when we say something like uh, science, you know, who do they think is delivering the science? Uh, how do they feel about authority figures? And then to what extent do they believe, you know, some of them are, um, there's a spectrum here. So some of them are reachable and then some of them have been immersed in broad spectrum conspiracy theorist groups that have been telling them for a period of years at this point uh, that public health is lying to them. The, you know, the science is bought by pharma, et cetera, et cetera. And so these very old canards that have been used to erode confidence in public health and vaccinations over a period of over a decade now uh, are simply being, you know, twisted ever so slightly and applied to the coronavirus conversation. So to what extent, given the ecosystem you just sketched out and that Margaret was adverting to, it doesn't sound so far like anything you've said has been inconsistent with kind of Margaret's sense of the problem and the, the, the world we're talking about. To what extent is a kind of primed system of intervention that has to do with identifying particular atoms 
of disinformation and either deleting it or labeling it or countering, you know, put, putting friction on its spread um, and maybe of sources too. How much does that seem like, all right, if we can just get that up and running and come up with a way that everybody would feel pretty comfortable with that it is actually properly sorting out the true from the false and its judgments are worthy judgments and transparent. How much does that feel like just fire that up as much as possible versus it's like, it's a drop of the ocean? So I think there's a, sorry, my kids are having a meltdown over an egg sandwich back there. <laughs> um, the, uh, I think the question of how do you reach people to counter, um, to, to provide people to, to kind of maybe um, find the reachable, if you will, or, or deprogram the converted who are more in the, the, the deep conspiratorial chambers uh, is, a, is a question that's come up over a period of years now. And that's because a lot of you know, the information environment that I was sketching out, again, it's content agnostic. This is a, you know, the same, um, infrastructure is used regardless of what the topic is. When we think about how to counter it, the challenge we face is that the current research suggests that um, that simply, you know, throwing counter-programming links into those groups, you know, on Facebook is is not going to do anything. One of the things that we saw in a very specific way is, uh, you know, our team looked at the spread of the pandemic uh, conspiracy theory video early in the early in April, April, May timeframe. And what we noticed was that in addition to following how that piece of content made its way around the various communities, how it hopped from where it originated, which was the anti-vaccine communities, to the uh, health freedom movement, which is the more sort of libertarian take on the anti-vaccine movement, um, to the wellness influencers, the QAnon communities, the sort of Venn diagrams of overlapping human interests is what drives a lot of this stuff. If I am a member of an anti-vaccine group and I'm a member of a QAnon group and I see a link I like in my anti-vaccine group, I'm going to go and share it into the QAnon group. And then someone else who's in the QAnon group who maybe is in a, a you know MAGA group is going to go share it into the MAGA group. And then the MAGA group person who knows nothing about QAnon or anti-vaxxers is going to turn around and share it into their local community, uh, you know, bulletin board type group, right? And so we see these pathways. This is you know, humans, ordinary people are actively participating in the process, you know, serving as the, the conduits for this content. So when we talk about what platforms can do and what interventions can take shape, one of the real challenges is uh, people who this content resonates with are motivated to share it. They think that they are helping their community by sharing it. So there's a real kind of altruistic uh, sentiment underpinning this idea that they have to help their, you know, fellow citizens uh, understand the uh, the evil at play. And so with the pandemic video, we watched those pathways happen. And then we interestingly did see there was about a two day delay before the fact checks came out because it takes some time to fact check the stuff. The problem is in that time, the video, the original video has amassed something like 8 million views. Um, so not all of those people are gonna even see the fact checks. But what we looked at was which of the groups that had um, engaged with the URL around the video itself, additionally engaged with the URL around the fact check. And the answer to that is um, they did get the video around the fact check. It was shared into the groups, but it was really shared with the idea that there was going to be, uh, that, that, that people needed to respond to it in the negative. So it was sort of like fact checks um, were shared into the group and with the exhortation to go and tell the fact checker how wrong they were. So it wasn't that they were, you know, they, the, so if you, if you were to just go. Yeah, it's turtles all at, the way down where yeah. somebody can quote something <laughs> and say, can you believe this crap? Rather than saying, I read this crap and now I believe it. And so yeah. the challenge for the platforms is how do you intervene given that environment? So they have three, uh, you know, buckets of moderation roughly available to them. There's remove, reduce, and inform um, to use. That's the um, kind of uh, policy framework Facebook uses and the others largely do as well. So oh, you want to say that again, because uh, it might not be familiar to many people, the framework. Sure. So there's remove, and that's what it sounds like. The yeah. content comes down, the group, the account, um, comes down. Uh, reduce is there's an algorithmic throttling that happens. So in the, yep. Um, and that is intended to reduce its distribution 
uh, through an ecosystem. Uh -huh. And the third is in form. And that's where you get the labels or the interstitials or it's, you know, uh, put either behind a little um, gray box or there's a request, you know, there's a note that says this content is disputed and the various platforms um, kind of given their design structures do that in different ways. And, and we should just be clear on that, like another three-legged stool, but each of those does sure sound just descriptively, it's social engineering. It's just keep people away from stuff that is informationally radioactive by either removing it, reducing it, or labeling in a way that says danger radioactive. Like that's, and it just seems like given how persuasively you're making the case, including in the case study of the pandemic, the movie, that the dynamics are community dynamics. They are identity dynamics. They're about these people like me. They're good people. I like them. We send each other gifts. We talk about our kids. Like it is a community. To what extent can interventions that are simply about atoms of information really, and I, I'm, I'm sure this is just echoing your own observation about uh, the dynamics here. I would argue there's um, there's different time horizons here, right? So there's short term versus long term. So in mm -hmm. the long term, there's a lot to be done with regard to uh, trust dynamics and you know uh, uh, scientific literacy, media literacy, um, for a vast you know <laughs> education. If we want to take it way back to the you know to the to the mm -hmm. beginning, um, so there's a lot of different social problems, and I think most of us who study these dynamics are the first to acknowledge that this is not a social media problem. Uh, this is not even just a media problem, though if we, again, treat social as a, a channel in that broader ecosystem, there's some interplay there. Uh, this is really, um, th but again, those are long-term problems requiring very significant efforts to address. Um, and also funding, of course, is, is another thing, right? Um, you know, how do you fund better media literacy, education, et cetera? Um, and then there's the other question, which is in the in the very short term, right? In the in the immediate here and now, in the state of this pandemic, there were a lot of missed opportunities over a period of years that could have potentially, you know, interventions, policy interventions that could have potentially shifted the outcome. But the fact is, here is where we are today. And so, in the near term time horizon, the question becomes: What do you do about a video like Plandemic? Do you, you know, as eight million people are going to engage with this content and are going to be actively misinformed? whether you know the kind of originators the deliberate kind of disinformation creators or just the people who see it and feel motivated to share the fact is in the immediate here and now uh something has to be done to you know to, to kind of minimize the potentially harmful effects of certain types of content and what we've seen the platforms do that i think is actually the right call is recognize that you know as you've noted mis and disinformation have a lot of community components but there are certain areas where the offline, the real world impact uh, are sufficiently negative that there should be some additional attention paid. And what that has translated to is, um, you know, Google had this policy in 2012, they named it your money or your life. And it was a recognition that uh, search results related to your finances or your health should be held to a higher standard of care. Mm -hmm. uh, they should, you know, again, this idea that if you were searching, if you had a new cancer diagnosis and you searched for cancer, finding a bunch of juice fasts that happened to make their way through, you know, strategic SEO to be the top results uh, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a deep problem because people were coming there looking for information about how to treat themselves, uh, what to expect in the course of their care, and serving them a bunch of juice fasts and garbage, you know, is, is, a, is, is a pretty unethical thing to do. Interestingly, that view of responsibility, that, that view of the downstream harms of misinformation didn't translate through to products like YouTube, which were treated as an entertainment place, right? So you, the idea that someone would go to YouTube to get their cancer information was not a thing that was really on the radar for a period of years until all of a sudden uh, that had become where people went. And by this point, we had uh, entered into the, um, the realm of kind of pervasive um, problematic content, as well as recommendation engines driving people in bad directions. And so again, there were, there were sort of off ramps that we didn't take leading us to where we are today. And this is where the interventions around remove, reduce, and form for particular types and pieces of content um, are really all we have at our disposal.
-hmm. which really poses, I think, a complex question where among uh, many of the technical types, as they contemplate responsibility of platforms for the information they convey, um, they, they they, there's been an attempt to say, well, let's see where they are in the technical stack. If they're a generic provider of bits, they may have less responsibility to identify the bad bits and slow them down or stop them or wrap them in a label. You know, Comcast shouldn't be having to figure out the dynamics of vaccines to know anything about anything. Whereas if they're closer to the top of the stack, they are an application and a service with the tippy top being maybe something like WebMD. <laughs> like, sorry, WebMD has one job, like try to be accurate about matters around people's health and lives. And then Twitter would be somewhere in between. But it does sound like if you make a generic, generative even service that maybe you intended for entertainment, but it turns out to be an important political platform, can you avoid responsibility by saying, no, no, I'm lower in the stack. I'm just making a generic service when there's kind of nobody else around to take responsibility as an intermediary. And I, I only pose this as a question because it's challenging a lot of my previously held assumptions, including the value of knowing where something is in the stack to determine its responsibility. Yeah, and I, I would just, uh, um, I find that, you know, sort of tugging at a, a deeper question, also a question that sort of came up for me in this lockdown moment. Um, where it was like, you know, it's not like people that are running through the halls of Congress or even people who agree with them that are not doing so, but are staying at home. It's not clear to me that they are there to have a reasoned debate. Um, it's not clear to me that I can, you know, there's no evidence and this comes up actually in the hospital a lot in, in pediatrics. Um, the, the, just to tell a little story, I, I had a patient one time who um, ended up being diagnosed with Munchausen's by proxy. That's when a caregiver becomes convinced that their child is sick and they keep, uh, and they do things to make their child sick to prove their point. Um, and often you see that, I mean, in my experiment, experience, it's more um, the, 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 the proxy, the person who's making the child sick actually doesn't know that that's what they're doing. Um, they uh, just become convinced that uh, you know their child is sick, and there's some emotional feedback that they're getting that in, that they enjoy um, from having a sick child. Anyway, in this case, uh, this little uh, child was brought into the hospital uh, to try to feed um, to try to feed them and see if they would gain weight. Uh, and of course, one of the possibilities was that the parent, the caregiver was uh, starving them, was not feeding them. And indeed the caregiver kept saying, oh no, no, this child is, you know, they, they have all these allergic reactions. I can't possibly feed them these things. So we ended up, uh, you know, very slowly with epinephrine at the side, you know, feeding the child the things that the parent claimed were, he was trigger, triggering an allergic reaction. Um, and lo and behold, it's fine. And the child gained weight. Um, and when we had the conversation with the parent, uh, when we called the, the Department of Child Protection Services um, and said we we're going to and inform the caregiver that's what we we're going to do, the caregiver was, of course, very distraught. In their mind, they were doing everything they could, you know, to, to, to do well by this child. But the thing that the social worker ended up saying to the parent, which always stuck with me, uh, was she said, there is no evidence that I can give you that will convince you otherwise. And that's why we're at this point. There was no evidence that I could give any of the congressional representatives or people storming the Capitol or people watching in support at home that is, go that is going to convince them uh, that the election wasn't stolen. But Margaret, and would you, you're, that's a you know, tragic and uh, just gripping story you just told. Would you describe, clinically speaking, mm -hmm. the psychiatrist described that person as in the throes of a mental illness? Yeah, oh yes. Yeah. And the next question then asks itself, to what extent are we saying that this is mass mental illness? Well, I, I don't know that, but what I, what I would say is that I'm wondering if when people are engaging online in conspiracy uh, theory content and building community out of that experience, 
it strikes me that their their goal when they are entering into that space is not to kind of learn the truth, right? Mm. And they're, they're not really in that frame of mind. You know, somebody when they have a new cancer diagnosis and is going online to search, you know, they, they want to really know, uh, you know, what's going to get them better. It's a very different kind of frame of mind in human enterprise. And it's sort of this issue of entertainment versus, you know, yeah, 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 learning, absolutely. right? I'm just like, people are, are storming the capital because it's kind of an entertainment for them right i mean it's a bloodlust it's a whatever um and i'll tell you that just to, to end uh what in one other little moment from the from the standoff in the capital that may suggest or lead toward something that i'm curious about exploring as a sort of remedy is well why uh when i became very frightened for that kind of 30 minute period um i really i thought you know what let's and i proposed i was like let's get up and leave <laughs> let's take off all of our identifying information open the door blend in with the crowd you know and leave um and uh you know i thought and the reason i thought that was because i thought gosh i don't want to have the confrontation when they come where they break down the door and find us hiding in fear behind it that will almost certainly lead to a violent outcome for ourselves um, anyway, I was, we sort of packed, we even thought, okay, let's pack up and do this. Well, right around the same time, um, some of the other members uh, that were also sheltering in place uh, were on a, a text thread, you know, with my sister. And um, in particular, there were two uh, black women who were newly elected to Congress who were also texting on this chain. And they were saying, you know, I mean, they were very fearful and they're like, we're never gonna see our children again. Um, we're, we're not gonna, you know, this is the end. Um, and, uh, you know, of course it struck me, right, that, that they were not considering getting up and melding into the crowd. <laughs> they were not going to be able to do that uh, because they were black. Um, and, uh, you know, that the, the moment passed, we ended up not, not leaving. Um, but then the most sort of violent part of the entire evening from my perspective was then when we had to, while we were all still shaking from fear, you know, listen to the concerns and the quote outrage and the, balloon juice of the Republican members of Congress arguing that the election in fact had been stolen. And we just had to sit there for hours and just listen to them. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this is the act of violence that is not somebody shooting you, but it's still violent, right? It's like you have to revolve around their concerns, their worldview. You're constantly in, in conversation with them, trying to convince them of something they are never going to come around to when your own life in, you know, the that was was in danger and the idea that your your children's life is in danger. And you know, it, it just made me think like really what the anecdote is for this is you know having to answer to other people's concerns. You know, coming into proximity uh, in, in a very real way with people who are um, you know, struggling with a problem in a very authentic way and, and, and uh, having to ad address them. And I was like, you know, I just, the marker of progress for me in the, in the new year is how much of my attention goes to the problems of, you know, these black representatives of Congress and their constituents versus having to deal with, you, you know, the, the, the sort of and pun intended here, the trumped up concerns of, uh, you know, of the, of the, of the folks that are speaking. So I, I do feel like, you know, we, I guess the larger remedy that I would like to propose is like, we need to have a lot more contact <laughs> with people who, um, you know, are, are bringing their perspectives and their problems to the table. And somehow we need to figure out on ramps for all of us to engage, you know, with them. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with these, you know, crazy ideas that are presented to us to try to refute, and we're kind of in this, you know, in this cycle. Um, and just also the woven within that is to what extent is anybody in a position of engaging with somebody else to separate between what you're saying is deeply, deeply, profoundly mistaken but I acknowledge that you earnestly believe it and that on the basis of those mistaken facts, we actually might be pursuing the same top level goal. It's just, right. you know, a huge gulf that might not be bridgeable versus this is an argument in bad faith. You don't really believe it. You're saying things that advance some other goal of yours that might just have to do with the lulls or something. Um, and how much that distinction matters either individually in interacting or in a policy, uh, private or public kind of interventionary way. 
Uh, Renee, I'm sure you have reactions to that. I know we're kind of at the top of the hour and I'd love to close out by um, first inviting any reactions you have, Renee, on the speed of the conversation. But also if each of you has a sense uh, as a new administration, in the words of the president, will be welcomed on January 20th at noon, federally in the US. Um, what would you highlight respectively as sort of a top priority if you think the federal government is a, a good locus to have a top priority here? Uh, Margaret for you know, shots and arms and that sort of thing, what would be the, the, the best thing to underscore? And Renee for, the complex problems you've been following. Is there some role for federal policy here? I'm, I'm curious if you want to close out with that. So I don't know, maybe Renee, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, any of that? Yeah, so no, I was listening. Um, I was just thinking of a meme on Twitter, uh, bad faith or brain worms. And, uh, and this is the, you know, the kind of um, salty way of, of alluding to the fact that some of the people, uh, you know, particularly a few senators, um, chose to uh, pander to those who continue to perpetuate this nonsense about stolen elections uh, in, in, in very, I would argue, bad faith because they see it as a, a path to, uh, to, to further continued power, unfortunately. And so that is a... Pardon? Or out of fear. Or out of fear, yeah. There's that uh, the Churchill quote about um, dictators riding on tigers from which they can't dismount, right? And the, uh, I think one of the challenges right now is the question of who is reachable. And this, this speaks to your, your question about what should the administration be focused on. Um, one of the dynamics, there was a paper that came out, I think it was, um, oh gosh, I don't wanna get the institution wrong. Uh, there's a paper that came out recently that, that alluded to the fact that the anti-vaccine movement online was far better at outreach to fence sitters, to sort of normal groups, normal groups of people, women, mothers, wellness influencers, and that they in fact regularly prioritized that outreach and that they produced content for those people in the format that they wanted to see it on the platforms where they were sort of reaching people where they were. And that echoed my own experience in 2015, looking at how the anti-vaccine movement in California uh, reached out to the fence sitters and how really the battle was for the fence sitters. It was not to deprogram the converted, it was for the fence sitters. And that I think is where the administration uh, needs to be focusing as well. There is a, you know, while there are extremists who are highly visible, um, they are not the majority. And that, that's something that we consistently see as well. And we have to prevent them from becoming the majority by ensuring that they are receiving uh, accurate information where they are in the format that is, you know, that, that where they're most likely to be receptive to it uh, from uh, communities that they trust. I've seen uh, Black doctors on Clubhouse recently doing just remarkable Q and A's, you know, staying on there for two hours, really engaging with the community. There's a lot of users on Clubhouse who are kind of members of this constituency, and so the Black public health and uh, medical officers getting on there to talk about the vaccine. That's the kind of thing that that sort of focus not only on the science and the rollout and the vaccine itself, but also on the recognition that the messaging component of this is just so absolutely critical uh, to reaching those folks who are reachable. Got it. And that, that again sounds too like a lot of work to be done at the local level by lots of folks in the field and maybe by the platforms, I didn't hear necessarily anything that a new Biden administration should jump to. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's been particularly well executed in the past, to be honest. And I think that's that's really the question. You know, there's um, the CDC puts out material in certain formats that's scientifically reputable, but it's like a, a PDF. Um, you know, recognizing that the information environment, the way people expect to receive their information has changed. And that blending, that, that, that um, you know, information becoming part of, of the content consumed on platforms that were previously for entertainment is, you know, the recognition that this is where people are getting their information from now too, uh, is just a part of, of how uh, strategic shifts in messaging design have to, have to progress in, in the very immediate term. Got it. Margaret? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think there's there, there's not just one thing, um, but I, I really love um, Renee that that focus on uh, which also chimes with a principle in child development, 
um, uh, the, the fence setter is, you know, or don't feed the trolls, you know, don't try to get into a back and forth on their terms of, of the sort of craziest element or the most extreme element, um, you know, really come at the, uh, the, the fence sitters, the people you think you can reach, but also I think coming at them in a very orthogonal direction. I mean, you, it's, there's nothing like human contact, you know, there's nothing like a real exchange with another human being who has your, their interests at heart. Um, to, you know, that, that does move, move people. Um, and that, where is that going to sit? I mean, when it comes back to the Biden administration, I think that we are, you know, they are signaling they're going to do a lot of things that I'm very supportive of, which is, hey, we're going to really have to uh, think about and put money into our, our public health uh, system. Um, I think uh, along a number of fronts, some of the technical that we talked about earlier in the hour about building a public health intelligence capability. Um, uh, and that's a sort of technical project. I think a lot of the, the vaccine distribution is going to be a technical kind of project. Um, but I also think that um, by uh, when we start to build out our public health enterprise in this country and reform it and build it in a different way, I think really putting at the heart of it um, this issue of how it interacts with individuals uh, in their moment of need and crisis, um, you know, is, is I think that the sort of the relational societal kind of glue <laughs> that it needs to sort of sit at the, you know, sort of be the, the, the thing that we um, build, the concept that we, that we build it around. Um, and I think that um, Renee, your work has really sort of uh, started to really lay out what that looks like, um, at least uh, you know on the um, on the on the media phase. So I really, really, uh, or the media platforms um, that you're discussing. So I really appreciate uh, your your insights today, You're giving me making me feel better. Um, <laughs> what <I> can do, <laughs> um, yeah. So we do have to, uh, uh, you know, hope that we make it through this this next week in in a way that is, um, you know puts us in a position to do that good work. Well, I'm so grateful, Renee, for your taking time to visit with us today and share what's up. And of course, Margaret, what a journey uh, you've described uh, just in the past week. And um, thank you for sharing that and uh, for enduring what you are and uh, uh, rising uh, above it. And, uh, we will continue our uh, Zoom cast as this uh, unfolds. I also just want to thank uh, Sophia Carter, Will Marks, Lydia Rosenberg, Ruben Langevin, um, uh, and Chris Small, who've helped uh, organize our COVID state of play uh, from soup to nuts uh, last year and now coming into this year. Um, and thank you all, uh, the attendees, for the questions you put in, for those watching later. Um, we've surely gotten a bunch of stuff wrong. Uh, we'll <laughs> do our best to own up to that <laughs> and uh, uh, adjust uh, uh, in future uh, episodes. But it's the middle of January 2021. And uh, here, amidst the numbers that we see and the challenges in front of us, um, Here's to a better 2021 and one of vibrant communities that together create our imagined community of uh, America wanting to um, beat back any challenge that uh, comes to us and come out the stronger for it. <laughs>